Hi, welcome to the Open Security Summit sessions in February 2023. And this is one about GitHub security tools. And uh, you know what we're going to try to do here is the first of hopes of many of these sessions where we kind of focus on the really amazing features that GitHub has been pushing and, and the whole shift left that you know, way it has materialized and, and how a lot of the time these days is not should you do it, is, is, is how you do it and, and actually what's the steps and how to make it super seamlessly on it right and i would say i, I can represent here both the ciso and the engineer right and i mean with the architect in the middle because i i've been on all of the areas and i i feel the pain and the advantages on those areas so maybe chris a quick intro from you and then andrea now we we're going with it great thank you uh so chris reddington uh i'm a senior manager at github uh focusing on enterprise advocacy so i work with let's say the budding kind of startups all the way through to the largest defense prizes, helping them understand the latest and greatest that GitHub's working on and how it can help in their day-to-day. -day. So exactly as you say, I think there's been a lot going on in the security space and a lot of opportunities. So excited to be here and talk through it. Cool. I think you were too kind to actually include me in this presentation part because I'm just suspecting a panel, man. <laughs> I'm really just a big part and listening in to what is actually new. And if I can actually share some of the experiences I had with the tools, I'll, I'll do that too. Absolutely. No, but I think you also can represent the threat modeling side of things and the AppSec side of things and, and how, you know, how we, we need to start integrating a lot of these things, right? And mm -hmm. one of the topics I, I hope we get by the end of it is, is also the, the alignment of some of the tools that GitHub does with some of the new innovations that we're seeing in threat modeling and putting artifacts like JSON in the, in the Git, in the pipeline. So that there's a lot of metadata into it. But really, Chris, let's start with a bit of a back to basics so if i would ask you what are if somebody's not using right github tools right and, and have the repos have the stuff there what would be the top five that you say you should start that you can add a huge amount of value and i i think we should frame this from the point of view of because a lot of the audience here is security professionals is how can you know if a security team is working in an environment where they have github right and they let's say that just landed right and they, they're not doing anything they're just using github for all the awesome stuff outside of security right so what's the top five you say they should start with mm, oh man what a question to start with so many ways we can go um i guess where i want to start is i think a lot of people have the preconception of you know github equals open source and github equals um, version control and that's kind of where it all ends but you know, if you haven't used GitHub in a while or maybe using other tools for the day job, there's so much more than uh, those kind of core aspects. So, you know, there's things like GitHub Actions, for example, for CI, CD. There's things like Advanced Security, which I'm sure we'll talk a ton about here today. Code Spaces to help easily go and spin up your development environments. There's been tons of innovation happening. Projects, which is actually a great... Projects, you know, absolutely. Kind of absolutely using that day so, to day but let, let's for frame this assume mm. that the organization we're working through is a power user right let's say yeah. they're using most of that except the security bits right mm. just because it happened right so mm. you know assume that they're power users they they know git they, they do in fact they might even do github actions right because i think these days you know most teams will have and there's a ci pipeline right let's assume that that's in place right mm. let's now security person joins in goes great and in security, they're like, ah, that's what we hire you for, right? So top five yep. on the security. And actually, M Michael, if you, when, you, when, you, when you're ready, just join the, uh, the party because I, I know you're here. So if, uh, oh, cool, there you are. Sorry, Emily. So, that's fine. So we were just starting, you know, we could give a quick introduction. Maybe just a quick introduction on you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I work for a company called New Day. Uh, they do a lot of credit cards in the UK. Um, some brands you'll have heard of like Aqua, some John Lewis, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I look after the security architecture team, including the application security team at New Day. And uh, over the last couple of years, we've been moving all of our stuff onto GitHub. So we use GitHub Enterprise, we have GitHub Advanced Security, and we're in the middle of a project moving all of our static code analysis to CodeQL. Nice. But there you go, right? So, <laughs> so, <Nice segue. laughs> so what I would basically, so, so Mike, I would say, let, let's start um, with basically the, the premise of, you know, new security team, new person just got hired, right? Join the party, GitHub, right? They're power users of GitHub. They know how to use GitHub Actions. They're doing projects. They, in fact, they, 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 they have been avid consumers of GitHub doing stuff there. But, you know, they have done security and they hired this, you know, person, right? To lead the security. So what's the 
top five. And then I think from your side and Al Chipino, that we can comment on as users, those are the ones that we like, or maybe there's a couple of others that we might want to chip in. But, you know, mm -hmm. Chris, top yep. five that they should really get really good bang for buck, really great to hit the ground running, lots of value added straight away. Yep. I think, um, you know, if you're using GitHub Enterprise and don't have advanced security yet, easy one is dependable because yeah. it's just available there as part of the, the service and you can go and turn it on for security updates. You can easily go and commit files to the repos then for version updates then as well. Um, for anyone who does know, Dependabot effectively using third-party dependencies, open source packages in your uh, projects. Many these days, I, I struggle to find a project which doesn't use open source in their projects. Um, you're able then to keep those up to date, which again is one of those common attack vectors, right? So that's one. Um, I think the next one I'd probably throw in, and this is one I'm kind of excited about actually, um, because there's been a lot of innovation recently is secret scanning. So that is actually part of advanced security. Who's ever been there where you've committed a secret to a repository? Like I have, it's painful. Um, it's not just the, I've leaked a secret, but now I've got to go and rotate everything and burn everything because you yeah. know that secret's now out in the wild there's the operational overhead um so that's always a challenge i think code scanning mentioned code ql there a minute ago there um so we'll come to that i'm sure a little bit um i think that maybe the fourth one and i'll wrap it up with four because i think that'll tie it quite nicely is not one of the core security features as part of those four different areas that we mentioned or three um is actually still with GitHub Actions. And I wrote a post uh, back in January, and I can share the link for folks as well. With GitHub Actions, yes, one of the um, capabilities that is available now is OpenID Connect and using that as a way to deploy to um, cloud providers, for example, or various um, platforms. So that scenario that I mentioned about putting a secret inside your source code what if you didn't even need to do that in the beginning and you could just deploy to the cloud providers without even needing the secrets in the first place? So, yeah, there's some interesting capabilities there as well. So those will be four. Dependency review maybe number five as well to prevent um, those vulnerable dependencies ever getting to production. That's probably my five. Actually, what's the difference between dependency review and dependable? Uh, good question. Um, so Dependabot, think of it as, let's say, what is already in production, already in the code base somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, it's there, it's potentially an issue. Um, whereas dependency review is more about, right, we've got a pull request, we've got a flow in terms of merging our changes and our commits into production. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent that from ever being an issue? So if as part of my pull request and my change, I've maybe changed a package number or I've introduced a new package. If dependency review, when it scans, detects there's an issue with that vulnerability, you get an error, that pull request is then blocked from you being able to merge it into production. Then. Mm -hmm. So that bit is actually part of advanced security, whereas dependable isn't. Um, so yeah, it's more of a proactive stance rather than it's in the code base and ah, now we actually need to go and fix it. Cool. So it helps you stay stay secure in that sense. yeah well it's actually a way to break the build right um if, if you wanted to right in that case right i mean you know i i take the approach and i you, you mentioned about shift left a little bit earlier um the term that i'm hearing come up more and more and i i think it makes a lot of sense is developer first security mm -hmm. so if you think about that developer stance and that developer kind of mindset how many times as part of your flow have you got, I don't know, you're using GitHub, you're using random other tool, you're using five or six different tools that security have mandated you to use. And you have to go through all of these different tools and all of these different panes of glass just to try and get your job done. There's a ton of context switching. There's a ton of overhead in terms of you able to get the work done. Whereas when you look at how GitHub is really approaching it all, it's trying to get it where the developer is, you know, where they're working, where are yeah. they? They're in the repository. So my alerts are in the repository. My um, code scanning alerts are in the repository. The secret alerts are in the repository. So it's all in that pane of glass. Yeah. But if you're coming from the security side, you know, there's still Siam integrations and these other things that you can do to bring them out into the tools you're using as well. So, yeah, I like this kind of developer-first approach that it's yeah. 
all in that pane of glass there. Agree. Yeah. I guess, Michael, from your experience with this, and do you have others you want to throw to the mix? You know? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the last one that you mentioned, Chris, is like one of probably the main reasons why we're moving to it at the moment, because it is tightly integrated with the developer experience already anyway. And we found that uh, we, we already had like commercial tooling, like kind of one of the enterprise security tools that you would expect from one of the big vendors. And we find that it was really difficult for people to understand and people to use. So, you know, people go, well, what do I do with this? And to be honest, they wouldn't even know how to log into it because the single sign-on integration right. was a little bit complicated. So we're like, we already knew that it was going to be difficult for people to make that an effective control. So it was like, all right, well, let's try and totally simplify the entire experience. Um, and then one of the things for the security issues, like you depend on what alerts go in there anyway, but then the, um, uh, I think if you want to plug in as well, other commercial tools into it, so say, for example, you have GitHub Advanced Security. If you take the results in Serif Upload format, you take it yep. from other tools. Again, you can push all of those alerts into the repo so that it's front and center for the developer to look at. Um, or basically, you just need to figure out how do you get your results output in Serif format, and then you can push it, upload it into the repo, and it's all there as well. Um, and then the other thing is the Security Overview tab. So once you've got it, you go in, you have a look at the Security Overview. Again, some of the other tools that we've used historically, it's been really, really difficult to track what's going on. And I just want to know snapshot right now what's happening with everything. Um, and I have noticed like over the last couple of months, and there was a load of features when went uh, into beta, which the, there's a program for that that people can join. Um, but in like last October, November, I started seeing that the security overview product team started throwing out lots of new views. And now they're adding in historical trends over time. and they're trying to work out how to add it so that if you've got your team set up, you can see by team and start reporting by team. So we've seen like some of the early previews and that, and it looks like really cool and I'm like desperate for those to get released really quickly. Awesome. Cool. Andre, any anyone from your side? I am actually quite curious regarding the, um, the secret scanning. Um, and I got a particular question, very specific, because I want to know if it's possible. You, mm. you wouldn't be, um, imagine that I need a query. I've identified a vulnerability that I believe that it's quite common, um, although I would like it to be, across all of the open source world. And I would like to reach out or make um, a query that would can, that will allow me some visibility into the numbers where that vulnerability actually is. And I want to be very specific because I'm still working on this, but imagine that it's part of an S-bomb uh, or it could be something that is common to all of the projects. How would I go about setting up something like that or I would have to restrict it to the repositories that I would actually own? Wow, what a question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I guess the other kind of angle, if I flip it on its head, the reason I'm kind of pausing on this is there's almost a, if I were a malicious actor and I asked the same question, because, mm. you know, that could be used for good or bad, right? If I could search I, any kind of repository. So yeah. that might be one maybe worth a separate follow-up, I think, because um, I suspect there might be a bit more nuance around that, actually. Cool. Um, yeah. So the, I'll, I'll disclose a bit more. That is exactly what I'm trying to stop without disclosing it first. And I want to reach as many people as I can to make them aware, although four of them I already have. But I'm actually having some resistance on actually mm -hmm. being a vulnerability. Now, I don't mind eventually having to be corrected and being wrong, that'll be okay. But I would like to have some numbers behind the initial idea, so the identify part. So if I can't actually achieve that, I don't really want to pull all of the open repositories down and do the analysis myself. If there was a tool that will allow me some visibility that you guys might have to get mm -hmm. some insights, that would actually be quite cool. So a bit like when some security vendors do comparison of industry and they actually don't share the particularities, particularities of what the, so I don't know, like the, the pitch, the pitching, um, errors or something like this. I don't want to disclose too much. <laughs> this is hard. I'm putting you in a bad spot. Sorry. So having a way to verify if something exists, but uh, not everywhere, and if need to contact somebody, have that ability. Yeah. I, I mean, the former, again, I think there's almost an inherent risk of doing something like that, right? Where, you know, if you could scan everything and then identify, that's almost 
pointing where you can attack. Um, but you cannot do it today, right? Like if there's vulnerabilities that have very clear patterns, right? You know, yeah. if you find a vulnerability on a particular framework that uses this particular method, you can just you can do a global search on GitHub and it would tell you every repo which you uh, can right? In that, theory, that's one way of doing yeah. But yeah, that I think we'll put to one side. But the kind of disclosing bit, um, have you? This was actually going to be my bonus uh, bonus tip. Let's say, um, oh, sorry. There's um, something that GitHub announced back in. October, I think, um, or November, um, called private um, disclosure vulnerability, private vulnerability disclosure. Um, mm. So what open source maintainers can do now okay. that their repositories, they can turn this on. Um, and whereas that scenario previously was you identify some vulnerability and you want to report it to the maintainer, mm -hmm. and then you have to kind of either email them or tweet them or find some kind of way to get in touch with them. Now there's this built-in way within GitHub of being able to disclose that vulnerability if the maintainer has turned that on. Um, so I think that would be the approach I would try and take with some of those repositories if they've turned it on, because then it's all dealt with inside of GitHub. And then it allows that collaboration privately as well until a point where you're ready to say, right, it's fixed, it's patched, let's disclose that now. And then there's the latest cool. version available. So that would be the kind of disclosure aspect, I would say. Sounds good. I'm just yeah, concerned there would be a lot of cool. people, a lot of conversations to be had. And if I could actually pass that book, <laughs> I'll be very happy to do so. Yeah, I don't know what our security lab team or security teams do around that type of stuff, to be honest. Um, I think, to be honest, Andrea, for that, I, I, I reckon you probably talk to people like Snake and some of the others. Okay. Who who are actively maintaining some of the those databases, right? Or or even the uh, the the, the CWE, right? So the, some of those guys have the relationship. I think. Well, I there's think also the GitHub advisory database. Remember as well, you know that's the database that we're populating, and um, mm -hmm. I think it brings in several sources as well. And yeah. you know, this is the idea, right? Is yeah. you've got however many repositories hosting their code on GitHub now you've got that side by side coming back to that idea again earlier of everything where the developer is working they're working in that github portal mm -hmm. you've got the disclosure yeah. aspect then right next to it as well where they can complete that and then the maintainer can then complete that within the repository as well so and where does it get disclosed into the advisory database where there we go it's all coming together you can see the picture then coming together I got places to go and look yeah. with people to talk. <laughs> Thanks. So that's sure. great. Like there, there's look that that was I didn't realize you know you, you had that one. Mm. I already learned something here. Okay, so so I was going to actually chip in with a couple of other security features that I I also I think some of these are that interesting blend of really good development practices but have a huge amount of security protection, right? So in addition to the ones you said, and just to recap, you said dependabot, secret scanning, the code scanning with code QL, GitHub Actions, and then dependency review and the private vulnerability disclosure. So that's the top six. So I would add, for example, branch protection. I think branch protection is massive, yeah. right? And, and actually, I remember the first time I saw it, it solved the problem that we actually had a workaround, which was annoying, which we actually had two repos. Literally, we had one call prod, one call dev, and we would literally use a pull request from one to the other. Right to control, I basically and and to be honest, it's not even just security. Of course, there's massive security advantages, but even from a somebody making a simple mistake, right, and then committing to master, right. I I, I think branch protection was a massive evolution, right. It's a good example of a security feature, an engineering feature, right, because it's it's just good practices that not everybody should be able to merge it to master, right. So I, I think that that was a nice big one. Um, the other one that I think also has some interesting, and I still don't think a lot of developers use is code signing. Right. I remember when I used to do training, one of my party tricks was to basically say, what's your name? Cool. And I'll literally do a pull request under their guy's name. Right. And, they, and, and everyone was like, <gasps> and then, then it was, I, it's you know, quite because of my training, I used to use exploits to, to show the demos. Right. Then I go, so let's talk about authorization, authentication, verification, chain of custody, all that jazz. Right. But the, I used to do that little demo, which is which is impressive because. You, you know, if you don't use code signing, you can literally look like somebody else, literally, right? And, you know, and think about it, GitHub has no way, right, of verifying that because the commit is just there. So code signing, and again, that, that has improved dramatically because for a while you couldn't code sign even your pull request, but now I believe they are. Yeah, um, and just before we jump into that, the private vulnerability stuff, I mentioned 
is also in beta, by the way. So again, some of that could change, but just wanted to call that out. Um, oh, no, I just yeah, enabled it, man. I the, just tried it. It's, it's cool. Like, you, exactly. you, go, you go to the option, you go enable, there you go. It's, it's, yep. cool. it's a very nice live beta. Yeah, but no branch protection rules agree. Uh, I think it's one of those that I almost just expect should be turned on for repositories. Like you mentioned, some people shouldn't be allowed to commit to main or to master. I'd argue no one should be allowed to, and everyone <laughs> yeah. has to go through that branch. That's actually true. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, maybe I'm a bit too uh, rigorous, but there we go. Um, but in terms of the code signing, uh, yes, you know, you can generate your own GPG keys, et cetera, and um, sign that way. Um, I think if you edit through the UI, automatically there's some kind of signing from memory. But that Actually, used to be the, the blind spot. The mm -hmm. blind spot a couple of years ago was that they, mm -hmm. you could sign it locally, but you couldn't sign it through the UI. Mm -hmm. Where now it's now improved that. And also code spaces as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you correct. can use code spaces. Yep. Um, and that's the beauty. As long as you've you know got everything turned on in the profile to say, right, yep, check. Yep. Um, anything then that isn't signed automatically mm -hmm. flags. And it was funny. I was doing some work the other day and, you know, as, as you do muck some things up and had to completely rewrite a repo because I didn't quite commit it. Right. I ended up not having my environment set up. Right. Didn't have my key and it flagged the whole, oh, this hasn't yeah. been verified. And it's been so long since I've seen that on my profile pop up yeah. because everything I do is signed now these days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just a funny, funny moment actually noticing yeah. that. But if you look at the, the, the trend of the S bombs, right? You know, it will the chain of custody will start to go on who actually is committing code, right? To the repos, right? And again, you have an S bomb and you're going, well, do you know who actually committed the code? We don't. Well, you know, that's kind of a bit of an issue, right? Um, so uh the other one that um I really like is the um, and I think Michael, you mentioned about this is that the pre-built checks, right? Is the fact that, and, and, and again, when that is done on a PR, it's so powerful because you literally have a PR, right? And then the GitHub Actions was done quite nicely where you have a PR and then you can literally see your checks, right? Done in sequence and it goes, yes, yes, yes. Oh, failed. Yes, yes, yes. And it, it's super powerful to introduce, again, not just the security stuff, but the more, you know, the, the normal CI pipeline activities. But from a security angle, it's really awesome because you can then start to put your checks and then, and, and even then you get to choose, do I break the build or not break the build? But it's important that that's a very sweet spot. Like you said, develop a first security, right? Prevent in a way that the PR from be submitted, but give very, very strict feedback to the developer, to the person doing the, you know, the merge so that they can really understand what's the side effects. And the thing I really like about those automated checks is as you say, they're non-negotiable, right? Like, whereas if you were having a peer review with someone in a pull request, it's like, oh, you know, is that really a problem? Uh, probably not. We can fix that next time or we can, you know, whatever. There's almost that human element of, ah, oh, it's fine. We'll let that slide. We'll put it to one side. Yeah. Whereas because you've got those automated checks as part of the branch protection rule, that is a hard rule. And you can even specify in branch protection rules which yeah. ones are required. Um, exactly. you, can even, you can even specify, hey, admins cannot over, override this as well. Yeah. So, you know, you can really bring in some some power there to yeah. ensure quality. Because, because that pipeline, if you think about it, like one of the things that's interesting when you also start to look at proper shift left is that even the security checks, there are lightweight ones, they are more expensive ones, and they are super heavy ones, right? And in, in an interesting way, in a, in a, again, in a mature pipeline, you can choose where to put them, right? You can you can have very light ones on every single commit, on every single thing, and then but once they do a pull request for review, you can run some more heavy ones. When you actually put a, a pull request into a release candidate, you can do even more heavy ones, so that you know only then when all that passed, that can then be good to go to main, right? And I think that's a and one of the things that I did in the project where uh, actually that's can you add that as a feature request, right? Please, can I add you a feature request? Because we implemented these GitHub actions, but it was, I have to say, it was the single most critical thing that we added that dramatically increased security and quality was we put auto tagging on PRs, right? And it worked amazingly well. So what would work is that you commit to the stuff when you wanted to do a, a merge, right? into, I would say, a release candidate, right? Or, or kind of, let's say, working branch, right? You get, so let's say we were on 0 0.7 point 
whatever. That was the release. The latest release was 0 0.7, right? Or 0 0.17, whatever that number is, right? Actually, let's so let's go. So the zeros, the, the, the main one is the main releases, right? So you got you got 0 0.7. That's that's all major. That's the official one, or 1 1.3, right? At that level. Then what you get is you get whenever you do a PR, that is, and, and the logic was. Anything that goes into the dev branch should be good enough for Go production. So we we are we were decoupling shipping to production to when the code hits the main dev branch. And the logic would be that actually it, it was also become a usability thing that we we realized that we couldn't push to production every day. It's not just because we, we could because we could. It's just that there was a cadence. We had to document new features. We have to kind of, unless it was an emergency, we actually realized that even the prod guys were like, dude, you know. Calm down with your features, right? Like we, we we need a way to freaking update our documentation, for example, right? But what was really cool was that as soon as they hit is hit that dev branch, you get a 0 0.71, right? And then the next one will be 0 0.72 and 0 0.73. And then you start to have a built-in, not just documentation, because every little major and sometimes we'd be major features. Sometimes it was a major feature that somebody was working on. And then it was good enough to be there, or it was a, a new experimental one, or it was actually even code fixes. But what was really cool, and it took us a little while to us to get this, but also we we also start to become good at rollbacks, right? Because if suddenly you're going, oh shit, that actually has a problem, we can start to roll back specific versions, or we can say, actually, we can't ship. For, it, we have cases where we go, hey, we already have seven point one, two, three, four, five, six, but then we realize that seven point three. Or 7.4 introduced the problem, all right? So we cannot ship that. So let's move all those out. Let's ship 0, 0 0.3. And then and then what happens is when you merge that into your your master branch, that becomes 7.4. Or so that, that, that becomes eight. So now now all of those become 0 0.8. So that's your release. So then we can say to the business, hey, anything that is now on the main one, the main branch, is a release, right? Now it, so but it doesn't mean that it goes out today. Some customers might want to get it today, but then we hand it over to the business, right? But what was really cool with the auto tagging, right, is that it really gave us a very great discipline for what goes into the main release. So if we wanted to say what's on this release, it was literally the tags, right? And then we, we became good at writing what the hell's on the tags, right? Because in the beginning, it was a bit of a mess, right? So suddenly, the team start to describe really well. So then you have things like security fixes, you know, security improvements, etc. So he gave her a great cadence. So it's another one of those. It's a little thing. But for example, like we start to get for example, visibility on the things that were happening that had security implications, right? And, and, and the tagging worked really well. Does that make sense? Let, let me ask you though, did you, was that an evolution from actually having um, like Jira, te, um, Jira tickets on the branching names? Was that an evolution from there or was just a different way of achieving it? Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, because we would then tag the GitHub. So then the logic would be every tag should be linking to the GitHub issues that addressed during that tag. Okay. Right. So, so on on the on the pull request, you we would then got the, the developers to link what they fix. Right. The reason the tags work is that allow you to group things together in a not logical way, and also it's it's almost the the quality gate. Say, hey, you've done a bit of work, and you're now happy that that work can go to main. So it's almost telling everybody that you should be coding as if it goes to production. Like anything that goes into that dev branch or that pre-release branch should be good enough to go into prod regardless of the timing, right? And it took a little while, but but the key was the tags, the discipline of the tags and the rollback of the tags became super important. Question on top of what Dennis just shared, in, in terms of creating a release with all of that information, is is this something that GitHub can do now? Because I haven't touched it in a while, I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I think it builds on uh, to what Dennis was saying there in terms of um, if you've tagged a commit, um, with a tag number what you can do is you can then get the difference between what yeah. happened between this version and this version yep i think what dennis is suggesting is almost a step further than what happens today but i i'm sure i've seen some actions that can actually do that we did it with action i'm yeah. just saying it would yeah, lovely yeah. if there was a built-in support because yeah, it's gotcha. because we made it invisible it was one of those that we build the action and then and then it became a standard Literally, the first thing we would do on every single repo was, in fact, I think we even published the action, right? And the action is basically just on every PR, you know, figure out the numbering and upgrade the tab and then figure out. So then we was, where are you merging to? Are you merging into our dev branch? Are you working to our 
projection branch. If you're merging to our main branch, we augment the major number, right? Or the, the second one, sorry. And then we we, we on purpose left the, the top one because the top one is for breaking changes. So you, you would not go from zero to one, one to two, you would go from zero of 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4, that would be the, the major release. And then and then the, the pull request would be 1.21, 1 1.23, 1 1.25, 1 1.2 per 20, right? And, and even it's interesting because we even start to pick up things like, hey guys, we haven't released very often. Right. I, I remember a case ago, why are we on 20? Why are we on 15? Like, and, and I was like, no, we should be releasing faster. They go, oh, because QA is bottom up. Well, there you go. Right. Why, why isn't why isn't QA signing off? Right. For example, or why isn't that team signing off the full release? So it's interesting because we even start to get um, you know, uh, the workflow. Yeah, totally just a, a, a good um comment on uh and totally like I, I i'll bring you in right you can you can chip in if you want right i i make a host right uh he says that's the way engineering teams work with you know for example realizing features and jira right so you can have this this tag could be directly connected to a jira story to think about it and then and then you connect the dots which again you can achieve already today if you're having like the hashtag number for the issue in in the um in the commit message, I guess, like, you know, fixes, hashtag issue number, et cetera, that kind of thing. Um, I guess maybe the con converse opinion here, the, the opposite side, I guess I don't want to open the can of worms of like branching strategies that <laughs> I think everyone has their beliefs on yeah, what yeah, ways are enough. good, what ways are not so good. Yeah. Um, but I think there's almost even more ambiguity in a strange way around like version numbers well they shouldn't mm -hmm. be you know i think with semver we've got like major minor patch versions yeah. like you say people all use them differently rightly or wrongly and i think the challenge is there's probably a bit of a coupling between what branching strategy people are using and the kind of versioning Ab absolutely yeah, yeah yeah absolutely right <laughs> but again simple. this is the power of sometimes if you push a good standard that is well thought through then people start using it i don't know michael any comments on these features that i just proposed so far i have a couple of others um, but, you know so far any or others that you think oh i really like that one yeah so like with the branch protection so well i'll do the the the, the tagging first of all because as you're listening I'm, I'm running through my head going how would i even begin to approach that at my current organization because there's a lot more freedom of branching strategies between teams there's not like a single standardized way of doing it so like i need to figure out how to do it for all the different variations which exist so yeah, it's definitely an interesting one to think about. And then ultimately, like with the, hey, I'm a security guy coming over telling you how to do it. Yeah, maybe I don't want to go there, but we'll see. Um, it would definitely make things a lot easier, though. Um, branch protection, uh, it's a thing which we've been looking at internally. One from the, cool, great control. However, uh, how do we stop people turning it off? So I would like literally writing a detection wall to go through the audit log to look for any instances of a kind of like did it, looked at what the event looks like. There's a like a branch protection destroy event and like cool. I, I want think, to know I think only the admins can do that, to be honest. I think you can already lock it so that most of yeah. your users should be editors. I don't know. Um, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm under the impression that he already has that capability. I, I think the branch protection can only be done by the admin of the repo. And then most of your users should not be admins, right? Think about it. The, the most they could do is commit to a PR. That's, that's yeah. you know, literally like, you know, what else, who else needs more than that, right? Um, so yeah, sorry, you know, continue. Right? Well, I think, the, I yeah, I think, I think in some cases, there's a few repos which are connected to mission critical or high risk applications that even then we're looking at, we're going, even though it's a small group of users, but what if, but what if, but what if, yeah. and at what point does the probability go down to when when the impact of something happening to that service? So we're just like, what what else could we do which is extra on top of that? And then the, the nature of the way that the configuration is done for each repo is like, actually, it'd be really nice to be able to just define it for the entire organization and have it grayed out. So even if somebody is an admin of a repo or that they're able to do it for a repo, it's fine. They're kind of locked out of being able to do that. So kind of how do you push down things from the organization? Because each repo kind of seems like it's managed as an island at the moment. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have been looking at over the last week is uh, there's a project from the Open Software Security Foundation called All Star. So it's like OSSF slash All Star. And it goes in and audits your repo configuration. 
And when there are security issues with the repo configuration, it will send an alert and it will open an issue into the repo. And there are some of the things like branch protection where you can define a standard and you can set the action to fix. So if you've defined what the configuration standard is, you can actually deploy this app, although you can build your own version rather than using the one from the marketplace. Um, and you can set the configuration. And I think Google use it for some of their projects as well, um, where you can set it to basically say, right, here's my branch protection rule. If you find any instances through the organization, because you install it as like a, a dot all star within the organization. But if you find any instances of where that's been disabled or not set up properly, just fix it basically. And, and it just runs in the background continuously. And it checks some other settings as well, but we'll probably look at deploying that over the next couple of weeks. Would that, yeah. would that be a policy at all uh, that GitHub has? Because I've seen something similar, but I'm not sure if it was in GitHub. You can actually specify, so on top of the permissions that you're actually allowing mm -hmm. per, per profile of user, you actually have a policy that defines what will happen in case of. And Michael, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to share a link to, to that one in the chat. Yeah, sure. Apologies. Yeah. Sounds really interesting to, to have a look. Is this possible, Chris? Do you actually have those policies now? Not for branch policy, branch protection rules. So there's policies for things like repository creation and visibility, et cetera, et cetera. But top of my mind i'm not sure if there's one there for ranch protection rules right now yeah because i i say i don't think right name right uh actually we also asked the same question is or can policies at github enterprise level prevent stuff like turning off branch protection and i, I think what we're basically saying is at the moment you need that third party tool um and by the way there's there's several right? like the, the industry there is is compliance as code right there's definitely a, a number of players now in the market and, and that was on my list of feature requests for you uh Chris to take to the team, which is, I think, I think that's a great space again for you guys start to enter, which is the compliance as code is where you start to define certain repos that have some compliance requirements, right? That then you can then start to apply that. So like, you know, again, you know, we, we might need to give admin rights to some teams to manage, but actually we probably don't want them to have what, what might be a full admin, right? On there, we want to have some enterprise policies that we apply on it, or or make sure they are forced imp implemented straight away, and then get a, a immediate alert if any of those policies get taken out, right? Because you can enforce that again, maybe as part of your your repo, right? Mm -hmm. Cool, Michael. Others that you were you want to roll, so we didn't don't want to. Uh, yeah, I can't can't remember where I was going after that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what we've been doing. And then actually, like, it was something that was suggested in an interview with somebody this week that we ended up like offering and agreeing to hire. So I got like, cool, new team member joining next month. Yes. Um, so we have, um, uh, they said, why, why are you setting up all your repos manually? Like, why don't you set up your repos as code? So concepts, and I think they, they she's implemented like a tool for this somewhere else to say like, yeah. just have like a self-serve vending machine for your repos. So rather than just allowing somebody to go create a new repo and then, oh, yeah. so no, it's like, no, we have a definition of what the standard is for a repo. You go in and request it and give it a name and it will just create the new repo for you, but it will have all of the, the right. right settings from the beginning. And that actually, it becomes the only way to get a new repo. Yeah, I, I've seen that done spectacularly where you got you have specific actions, almost like the minimum baseline for everything you want. Even think about security pipelines, security tools, etc. It's a lovely place for us to already make sure that a lot of the stuff is enabled by default, right? Um, like the other thing I'm interested in is I've been looking like a lot of uh CI CD security because as we've been moving over, I've had like development teams saying, Well, we're gonna use GitHub Actions. And we're like Okay, fine. That kind of sounds nice in principle, but we need to work out how to do it securely. And it's like, right, well, we can do it for continuous integration, but then by the time it goes to deployment, it's like, well, that's the keys to the kingdom because it can access production. So it needs a, so we've been looking at what to do with self-hosted runners and stuff like that so we can have more control because it brings us into the scope of different compliance requirements. But uh, yeah, just looking at the whole attack surface of GitHub Actions and malicious actions and going like, hey, is the Pendabot, are you going to start not just looking at third party libraries, but third party actions and detecting like malicious ones? So make sure that there's nothing that people are injecting because it's just more and more of the attack surface that I'm starting to think, ah, if I was a crafty person, I'd do something here. And then looking at some other org, there's a new OWASP project with like top 10 CI CD risks. And it's like, yeah, I need to worry about all of that stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, I think in some of these, you know, you, you might, you know, for more critical assets, you know, you might want to just re-implement the action yourself, right? Or have mm -hmm. a fork 
your action to make sure that if somebody gets owned, you're not the first one, right? Yeah. <laughs> because at least if you have a fork of it, but also for change control, I right? think about it. GitHub Actions is a, is a mission critical part of the infrastructure, right? Somebody could do a fix, you know, for something that breaks your entire pipeline, right? So, so again, you know, I would definitely recognize, recommend you to fork the action, right, into your own repo, and then you use those from there. And again, that allowed you to, you know, if, if, think about it, if anything you should be code reviewing at regular interval is the code in a GitHub Actions, right? Yeah. And remember that when you use GitHub Actions, you can pin to a char of a, a commit in a repository. Yeah. So rather than depending on like a tag, like a V1 or a V2 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you depend on the SHA, then you know it's going to be that version that of the repository one, yeah. at that point in time. Um, the other, there was another point that was in my mind, which is just to, ah, uh, to pend about with Actions. Um, I believe Actions is one of the supported um, package formats as well of uh, Dependabot. So it'll be able to detect a, and bump and say, hey, you know, there's a new version of this. And I think in the GitHub advisory database, I'm just going to check this out now as we're talking. Actions is one of the, uh, yeah, GitHub Actions is one of the listed ones there. It's very low in terms of reports, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's uh, some there as well. So I'll uh, put that link in the chat here. Cool. Um, coming back to the CD aspect, though, that that's the one that really excites me because I think you're right. Like, it comes back to the point in the very beginning with passwords and secrets and credentials, right? If we yep. leak them, if we're too openly sharing them, what's the potential risk of that? And that for me is why I really love this idea of open ID connect and GitHub actions because yep. um, what I can do and my background is more with Azure. So I'll use Azure as an example here um, on the Azure side, I can set up like a service principle or an app registration and say, right. Um, any GitHub repository, or sorry, not any GitHub repository, a GitHub repository with this organization and this repo name from this branch or in this environment or with this tag number or matching these scenarios yeah. is able to access this app registration. And then on the um, actions side, on the GitHub side, I can then specify, right, I can use this client ID, this tenant ID, this blah, blah, blah. And because of those two pieces of information together, inherently tr um, trusting each other, yeah. you, the action can then go and run. You don't need to have any of those um, secrets or credentials anymore. So it's a really nice kind of flow where you can then start to the point in terms of limiting the blast radius, controlling what you need to control. Those days where you need to think, right, hold on, I've got five, 10, 50, 100 different app registrations, each with their own password. Yes, you may might have that many or more, but now they don't have the passwords anymore. Instead, it's the trust on the workflow yeah. that, is the, um, that is the piece between the two. So of course, then you want to make sure who can actually run the workflows, who can push things in there, what are they going to run? That's you know, then the next point down the line. But I, I think with clouds and the world we're living in, even you know, with development tools, identity is one of those real core security boundaries that you need to think about, right? So um, Open ID Connect, I think, is um, is going to be a big, big piece of that whole deployment strategy part. Cool. So I had a couple more. Um, I actually, you know, I, this is now a bit of the low ones, but it, again, it makes a big difference, is the great support for having a security policy and security advisory. Right, you know, like on on again the GitHub repo, it's just you know it just raises the bar, right? And and also I, I think a lot of teams should be thinking about what happens their vulnerability that you need to report, right? What happens if there is an advisory? And again, those little things just just increase the um, you know the the kind of the, um, the professionalism. And sometimes I I I found that having a team thinking about okay, what would you do if you had to report a vulnerability does wonders. For them to start again from an engineering point of view, to start thinking, okay, how what what will happen, right? And 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 it's not just in a way, it's not just security vulnerabilities. What happens if you need if you to push a breaking change, right? What happens if because that's you know you can argue it's almost security vulnerability, right? You, you're going to break every one of your clients. It's actually denial of service every single client you've got, right? But having again though that that professionalism, that standard, right? I think is super powerful. On on there, and again, that's the feature, right? You just go there, enable it, pretty cool, right? The other one I like, which is again, 
it's it's i'm not sure if there's actually a name for it but it, what do you call the little labels is that is it labels did it have labels um or it, issues it, you mean no 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 for the repo you know how you can have oh, all the topics little, topics is it topics mm -hmm. mm. yep well the one that says x but you know, 93 version control blah 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 passes the build no it's badges sorry badges right right Right. There you go. Sorry, I, that was the one I was looking for. Yeah. So I, I actually think that again, it's it's a, a little feature, but it's it's very powerful because it starts to gamify the whole thing, right? So so again, like we might not be able to break builds, but having repos that shows, for example, the number of open vulnerabilities or number of, of risks, the number of you know, for example, even code coverage that is goes there, etc. Those little badges are great ways to gamify, right? You know, the situation and they make it very visible. I remember even creating once a page that had all our main repos and all the badges on it because you were great you gave a great, a great little sort of top level this was before the, the central security hub thing right but but again the badges are, are a great little feature that you know it's basically is a marked implementation right and, and github supports the badges in all sorts of different places yeah I think again, the way my engineering mind goes into is a bit like the scenario we talked about earlier. There's so many different ways something like that can work. And this is why I'm not in engineering because then I start overanalyzing things, right? But, um, you know, if you had a mono repo versus a repo per different microservices, as an example, would you kind of roll that up? Would you want it broken down? How does that all work? So there's lots of nuance to that. But it's an interesting idea and interesting concept. Cool. So um, the the other one, and okay, now we have to talk about the, the really great little development, which is the GitHub Copilot. Have I, I don't know, Michael and, and Andre, have you guys tried it, or have your developers tried it? I didn't have um, access when it came up. Uh, yeah, I haven't. I haven't heard too much about it. I've heard mumblings over the last couple of weeks about it, but not like an active initiative or something. Or would it just? It, yeah, but I'm, it I'm is, waiting for it to come. I, I couldn't recommend it enough, man. It is crazily impressive, right? You know, it is. It's one of those things where, you know, it's it's again, it's a bit like Chat GPT, right? It's is the the other time when I felt there's a level of intelligence here, right, that was not there before, right? And even as a developer, you know. It's, it, it actually speeds you up because there's, it, in a weird way, it starts to learn how you code and how you pattern things up, right? So, and it gets to the point where it will give you, you know, again, I think there's some development styles are make this easier than others, right? But I definitely feel that it's a great power, but also they just announced a nice feature where they now do GitHub um, compile the security scanning on the recommendations okay. to make sure that it doesn't, uh, Chris, I'm getting this right, right? that doesn't actually give you, for example, a code sample with SQL injection. Yeah, and I guess the thing with that, to be really clear on, is that's never going to be perfect. So yeah, it's not a replacement for all the things we've talked about with like code scanning and yeah. um, all of these pieces. But yeah, I think it was uh, earlier this week, there's been um, some updates to Copilot um, and Copilot for Business, in fact, as well around that. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time, exciting time. So would, would that be similar to like linting? Like if you take like an IDE linter and it like just squiggly lines underscores and go, hey. No, no, no. It gives you literally, dude, it gives you code samples. Okay. Right? Like like not, not being funny, right? It's like, you you know, there, there's a couple of things where I think they're nice party tricks where if you type a function to say, you know, map we do this or, you know, calculate X of Y, right? Or, or basically do, you know, it's almost if you can describe a function in a certain way, it would actually give you a nice code sample. To do that, right? So, you know, if you write a code sample, let's say, you know, is number prime, right? Or is number thing or factorial this, it will give you that. But the ones I found impressive is the ones where it starts to pick up your own coding styles and start to pick up the kind of pattern that you're going to write next, right? And what I, what I think it gives us, and look, it's like everything, right? Every tool, if you if you use it, but you have no idea what you're doing, you're going to screw you. You know, you're going to make a mistake. But guess what? You're going to make a mistake anyway. Maybe you make a couple less mistakes now, but you're still going to screw it up, right? But what I think is very powerful is actually gives a level of consistency, but a level of advice, especially if they now start to make sure for example, it doesn't have SQL injections, it doesn't have certain practices. It actually starts to almost create more robust code by default, right? Imagine if you're coding on React, or if you're coding on you know, a, a language that has crazy dangerous methods, but you can, it can give you a code sample that doesn't have that, 
But the bottom line is that it's still, you still have the developers still signing up the code, right? You still have everything else that goes through it. But I, I think it's, it's, it's also introduced almost like the dream that we had, you know, 10 years ago on static analysis. It would be amazing to actually provide great advice and a developer as it's coding. And, and this is kind of there, right? It provides that. But it gives so, you really good code samples. There's a flip side to that. And it's something that I've been debating with myself and I would like to get your thoughts on this. So th this is like an evolution of the snip sets that we used to have, right, ourselves and that we yeah. use, but those would be ours, right? And so now we actually have an artificial intelligence that looked at everyone's code and decided, given whatever the algorithm decided, that those things are good. So what we will end up having is the average decision of what was good. No, it's not. Can, no, 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 I'm telling you, it's not. Okay. The code samples that I get are literally my code. I'm okay, not, no, I, I, I wouldn't say this if I hadn't experienced it, right? I have Look, I, I got to the point where if I'm coding now, literally the code, even the way I format the code, and I have a very particular way that I like to format the code, right? Okay. It, it starts to do like that. So yes, I'm not getting the average common denominator, right? Of the code out there, right? In fact, I would sometimes argue that, and this is what I was talking about, I'm sometimes arguing that, is there a way for it to maybe give you an opinion on my code to say, hey, dude, you know, you always do this? <laughs> there might be a better way out there, right? So I'd jump in here and just be really, really clear on this, that um, if you've got questions around Copilot, take a look at the public page because there's a really yeah. extensive set of FAQs around it about what it is and what it isn't. And, you know, it's not kind of looking at like lowest common denominator or something like that. It is generating new code. It is generating code as a result. So, you know, to what we've kind of talked about in terms of um, the security aspects, again, you know, would you trust code necessarily that um, you've searched something to go to, I don't know, Stack Overflow or something like that? No, you'd still go through those same processes of yeah. what you take to accept code into your code base. My, my concern, Chris, is more on, on having junior uh, developers that don't get the privilege of discovery through failure and actually get the solution presented to them, which doesn't lead them to think for themselves. But they would make even worse mistakes. But they will learn from those, and now we're stopping them from learning to, from mm. making mistakes. And that is the resistance that I actually have. There's actually been some really great research. Um, again, I, I point you to the Copilot um, page. That no, that one I already got. <laughs> um, there's been some really good research in terms of how it's enabled people to kind of learn, be more effective, etc. Yeah. So okay. I'd, I'd encourage you to read that. Yeah. Okay. Really I'll give research. another example, man. Like I, I use ChatGPT these days to ask really complex questions on Python. And, mm -hmm. and and yes, you know, not, I'm not saying that every answer is correct, but it already gave me answers and, and, and context that it would have taken me five pages to figure that out. Right. And, and I, and I think, yeah, you know, I, I feel he ratchets up some of it, but of course, you know, somebody doesn't fully understand what they're doing. They got, they have a problem because they, they're going to have to trust implicitly on, on, on what's there. Right. But you still get the logic, but I, 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 I having experienced it, it's definitely not the lowest common matter. It's definitely, your code being replayed back to you, right? In, try this. And that's why it makes sense. I think that's why it's been successful because every developer goes a little bit differently. It wouldn't make sense otherwise, right? It wouldn't have been successful if you suddenly start saying how the other developer next door codes because this developer is going to go, that doesn't make sense to me. I, th I think it was like a closed beta in the beginning, right? Because I tried to get access to it and I couldn't. There was something that I actually didn't do properly. Right that was a couple of years ago. It's been... Yeah, that was the so, last time I probably touched it. Right? Yeah, so yeah. Copilot launched in June or July of last year for individuals. Yeah. December then for business. And um, actually just this week, we've announced some... Uh, enhancements and changes yep. so that now anyone can sign up for copilot yeah. for business as cool. well yeah. um, cool so we're top of the hour this was i thought i thought it was a very great session right a really great conversation any final thoughts maybe just go around um michael any final comments on or things that um, are interesting yeah i think like the, the the thing that we tried to embrace with it was just the business had already decided that and engineering had already decided they want to move to it so the mindset we tried to take very quickly was just embrace it and try and find all of the opportunities to make things better rather than going uh it's new and it's different from what we're doing and slow down it's just like all right well what problems can we fix through this and just take advantage of that and just try and use it to accelerate what we're doing in the security teams as well very cool chris um i think for me just remember the basics you know things like branch protection rules automation how it can help with the 
quality bars, etc. And then you can bring in all of those security features we were talking, like code scanning and dependency reviews, and they just become part of the process. Brilliant. Andre? Very surprised that you didn't mention the dependency graph on here. I'm guessing that's nothing new there, but I'll have to look into it. Uh, th thanks for this. I really appreciate it. I, I will actually will try to reach out, Chris, uh, probably on LinkedIn or so, regarding that conversation regarding secrets. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of stuff here that was a really good refresher. And to know, I'm going to have to play with Copilot as well. Brilliant. So yeah, so this was a great session. And, and let's try to do a couple of others in the next summits, and especially you know maybe find some specific topics so we can zoom in more on those and, and, and have you know, also, you know, other panelists and these panels like that, you know, want to focus on a particular area of this, but thank you very much. And I see you guys around. Thank you. Thanks.